Okay, it's 2.02 now. I think we can get started. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome back to ASIC seminar series. I hope you had a great uh, spring break. And um, I'm John, the seminar coordinator. So I will be moderating the seminar with our communication specialist, Kathy Manley, um, our um, director, and Williams, and our associate director, Ralph um, Ferrero, um, also join us. Um, and I believe um, Ralph will be introducing the speaker. Um, so this seminar is being recorded and the recording will be published on our YouTube channel. Uh, it usually takes about one week or so, uh, so please uh, feel free to check it out. Um, and um, after the presentation, we have a Q&A session. So please feel free to bring up um, any questions um, we encourage you to speak out um, with your mic, or you can chat us your questions um, and we'll read it out. Uh, so um, I'm going to turn this over to um, our associate director, Ralph Ferrero, um, and he will be introducing the speaker. Um, so Ralph, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah, thanks, John. Yeah, we're, we're pleased to have uh, Professor Annalisa Bracco from um, Georgia Tech. Uh, university, where she is professor and associate chair for research in the School of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences. Um, got her PhD from the University of Genoa uh, in Italy, and also uh, spent time um, doing research at Woodhull's um, Oceanographic Institute in uh, Massachusetts. And her specialty is on um, geophysical fluid dynamics and uh, also um, the influence of uh, oceanography to climate change. And um, she's gonna tell us a bit about um, uh, her way of understanding the climate system. So I'll turn it over to her. Thank you. Thank you, Rafa, very much. And thank you for the invitation. I'm going to uh, present some work that um, it was done really by a student of mine, Fabrizio Falasca, who is now a postdoc at NYU in the group of Lorazana. And what we did, um, what he did, and we did together in his thesis, is to go back to our roots in dynamical system theory and try to look at the climate system using some of the new tools that have been developed using machine learning and dynamical system um, theory um, to look at the climate in general and how we could potentially work with those tools to improve a um, couple of climate models. Let's see if I can. Oh, okay. So what are the challenges that we have when we are looking at climate models and climate science in general? We have a system which is multi-scale and is really strongly multidimensional and is nonlinear. So we have a large number of variables. We have still limited observation. And at times, we don't even know the equation. Think about aerosol and clouds interaction, the parameterization for ocean mixing, some of the cloud dynamics, which we still don't know exactly how they are going to happen. We have a weather on advantage, the, and this has been pointed out very nicely by Vittorio Lucarini in 2016, um, that because the climate system is nonlinear and dissipative, the dynamics should be confined on a manifold that uh, has a lower dimension than the full state space. Just to give you an example, of what that means. If you're taking the Lorentz end system, which is the easiest climate model system you can think of, you have three variables, three equations. But if you look at the dynamics of that system, what comes out of it as a dimension of just above two. So in other words, when you start adding nonlinearities and dimensionality on a dissipative system, your overall dimension is less than what your real dimension is less than what you actually add just looking at the equation and variables. So that the base for any kind of dimensional reduction that you can think of applying to the climate system and the most obvious one, the one that we are all used to with PCA, so simply UIF and principal component analysis. 
However, EOFs are linear. And so they don't account for the nonlinearity component of the system as well as we would like very often. What um, I would like to do in this talk is to introduce a kind of new framework to reduce the dimension of our climate system and characterize the manifold. So really characterize the object that describe the climate system in the same way the butterfly does for the Lorentz system. So go in the phase space, look at what that system look like, and then characterize some properties of that and compare how models are doing versus area analysis. We are going to use two CMIP6 models and era five as area analysis. Um, the two CMIP6 models were the two that had for the at first uh, daily data available. So they were really um, selected based on the availability of the data when we started this project. In order to characterize the uh, manifold, you need high frequency data. And so um, daily is what we ended up using. And we ended up using them over the 79, 2019 periods, both for the analysis, the reanalysis and the models. Um, and the two models are MPI and EC Earth. Um, and then we considered also the models under the 585 scenario uh, from 2060 to 2100. And again, um, the daily data, especially in the scenario, were a constraint. This is just a brief introduction um, of the models. Um, the MPI one is a lower resolution. ECR is considered a, the one we're using is the higher resolution version of it. So MPI is a resolution of one by one degree um, in the atmosphere with uh, 95 vertical levels, uh, does not have a dynamic vegetation, and it has um, full biogeochemistry for the ocean. ECR use the um, MCNWF IFS model, which is a spectral model, uh, T 511, which is essentially a spectral resolution equivalent to about 39 kilometers. In the ocean, uh, uses NEMO and um, at a quarter of degree resolution and uh, Pisces for the biogeochemistry. It has a dynamical vegetation model and use also at the rest of um, biogeochemistry. We are going to focus on the um, tropical Pacific and Two reasons for it. One is such a source of global teleconnection that, that it's just a really interesting place, especially when we want to look at the climate system through interaction of multiple variables. And the other reason is that we were developing these methods from scratch and we wanted to be in a place where we had a lot of literature um, and a lot of understanding of the area already so that we could test some of the hypotheses they were bringing forward or the framework, knowing what to expect essentially. Just as a reminder, there is still a lot of uncertainty of what ENSO is going to do in the future. So that remains a problem. And we still have models that shows ENSO getting stronger and eventually with a longer periodicity in the future and model that do exactly the opposite. Um, has been explained as a possible uh, in, uh, outcome of poor resolution with uh, an article published in 2021 saying that if the resolution of the models is it's high enough, in reality, um, there is a weakening of ENSO. Um, I'll show you today that that's model dependent because uh, ECR, which is one of the um, high resolution uh, models in the CMIP6, if you don't, the, the model that was considered in that paper at that um, scenario with four times CO2 as 
as industrial compared to industrial. In our case, this is just the ramp up to the end of the century, but we are not seeing any weakening at all in, in that situation. Anyway, uh, just as a reminder, we still have issues trying to understand what those models are, are doing in this area. And there are still very, very different responses of those models going into the future. And one of the idea that we have and we wanted to verify is that probably while those models have mean states or overall behavior for the recent past that look similar, they, have, they, they reproduce the past state with interactions among variables which are very different and among them. So they're kind of compensating in ways that um, then cause the evolution to be significantly different into the future. So this is just here because we will see a little bit of that through this talk. So how this uh, manifold learning um, work? First of all, we have to select a number of variables and you can select as many variables as you want if you have computer power enough. Again, we were developing the method, so we, we kept it a little bit constrained. Um, and we use four variables, uh, sea surface temperature, uh, near surface winds, UNV and OLR, um, using OLR as a proxy for cloud and then having sea surface temperature and winds as um, three other variables that strongly characterize El Nino and ENSO and overall the tropical Pacific. Um, we had 40 years at daily resolution. So our dimension in time is about 14,000. And the dimension, we downscaled everything at the lowest resolution we had, but we did test it for resolution as well. And so um, we used everything at one by one degree. And that makes us, uh, for the regions that we consider, a dimension of 17,000 about. So essentially our system is 17,000 by 14,000. Then we identify the manifolds using both a linear and a nonlinear decomposition. So we, we go into spectral space using PCAs or using isomap. And we choose isomap because it's really a kind of nonlinear evolution of PCA. It's very easy um, to compare the outcome of the two and um, also understand how isomap work on the data. Um, isomap as um, all those non-linear uh, non dimensionality reduction methods, there are several now around have parameters that you have to uh, decide. Um, and another reason to choose isomap was that there is only one parameter, and that is the radius um, of a distance around which you can, you have to make the assumption that the manifold is locally flat, which in other words means that your system is linear within that radius. And in our case, um, this was uh, chosen to be 10, which essentially the 10 nearest point for each grid point that you have, for each time and space re realization that you have, is going to be um, linear with the 10 surrounding. And uh, once we have this manifold, that it's nothing else than once you project it on a three-dimensional space, look very much what you will get when you look at Lorentz in spectral space. Uh, you can then estimate um, properties on it. And especially you can estimate a local dimension um, so what is the actual, what, what is the number of degrees of freedom that describe the system in that point in space and time? And uh, what is the inverse of the persistence of that uh, state? Which in other words means how sticky is that state? How, how much time want to spend around that state? So if you are in one specific state on your system, how long you want to stay in that state. So 
So in terms of um, if we use Lorentz, for example, um, at point and space time, for example, Z in this figure, um, what the local dimension does is looking at how many other points fall within the orbit of that Z point. So how busy it is, essentially. And this is what comes out if you plot the um, dimension of your system. Um, if you if you move away from and you have very few episodes around one point, so you don't tend to be there very often, uh, that point will require an, a higher dimensionality to be described because there is a lot of uncertainty around. Um, if you are in a fixed point, your dimension is going to be very small because you are, when you are close to the fixed point, uh, whenever you are close to a divergence point, um, which in the um, Lorentz, for example, it's right at the center of the two ramification of the two wings, um, there you have a very high uh, dimension because you can go in any possible direction around you and you can do that really quickly. So it turns out that if you take, so essentially this is a, a the dimension of the whole system, but instead of it being given as an average, it's given at each point in the phase space. And it turns out to be correct because if you average over all the numbers that are in this plot, you do get the 2.06 that is expected. In terms of persistent, instead, it looks how many points in, in the phase space there are around the, the place where you are. Um, and essentially is calculating the inverse. It can be thought as the inverse of the average of the time spent near a certain um, location in the phase space. Um, so it's a good proxy for quantifying the stability of the points in the, in the um, state space in terms of time. So a fixed point is going to have a very uh, low theta because it's the inverse, because they're they are stable. Right? So if you're close to a fixed point, your theta should be go close to zero so that your stability is nearly in infinite. And if you are on the outside of the butterfly wings where you really don't spend much time and you go really quickly and fast move away, your theta is going to be high, which means that your stability, uh, your persistent is going to be low. So what does it look this with this, this kind of the composition and this kind of system? What, what the manifold look like for the climate system? Now, um, we can do a dimensional reduction and what we get, it's the um, residual variance time series uh, which is uh, isomap does not give you the explained variance, but allows you to calculate a residual variance. And so we are comparing the PCA and isomap residual variance. And then we are taking the first two or three components and plotting them. And it's not that we are throwing away the other components. It's simply that we cannot visualize the other components because the dimensionality just becomes too high. So what you see here is the um, visualization of the first and second isomap components or of the first, the second, and third isomap components um, for ERA-5, MPI, and EC Earth, colored by the time, by the day um, where those were plotted. So you have essentially um, 14,000 dots. Each of them represent the state of the system in this decomposed map at that day. The first thing to notice is that here we have not removed any seasonality. And so you, what you get is essentially the seasonal cycle being the dominant piece. And so you get this, this kind of cylindrical um, shape and your system is just going around to the year. 
spanning the four seasons. Um, what you see in era five that you don't see at all in the other two in the models are those points that kind of move away from the seasonal cycle, from the traditional seasonal cycle, from this all on 3D, three-dimensional blob that you have. And those actually correspond to the very strong El Ninos that we had. So if you look at the time of those events, the dark blue is the 83 El Nino, the kind of um, lighter blue green color is the 97. And then in light green uh, kind of mix there, but not as strong as the other two, and especially not non-linear as the other two, is the 2016 event. The other thing that you can see from here is that the residual variance that is explained by the um, isomap um, is lower. So essentially you are explaining more variance using an isomap than using PCA for the same number of components all the way until about 10. And then the two pretty much converge. Uh, the behavior between the models and the observation is very similar. In other words, the models are able to capture the seasonality properly in the correct way. Here we are just plotting the uh, first isomap component for the tree on the top, and then doing a regression of the four variables that we consider, because remember here we put all the variables together and look at what that projection looks like in era five at the top. The, the the one that is a letter A. And at the bottom, what you see is the difference between the ERA5 projection and the MPI or ECR projections for all the four variables that we considered. So in other words, that is a bias of just the first isomap component when it's regress on the four variables that make up the whole system that we are considering. You can see that in terms of um, OLR, the error is pretty large, similar in shape among the two models. The same is true for V. The two models have a definitely a different error when it comes to U. Um, again, a relatively similar error in uh, sea surface temperatures. Now we'll remove the seasonality and we're left with the variability. Here results start to become more interesting because what you see at the top, at the very top, is that the residual variance that is um, that remains when you're using isomap versus uh, PCA is significantly different with isomap doing a much better job. In other words, in terms of variability, the nonlinearity is important. PCAs are not capturing it, but that's not the case for the models. The models are much closer in the variance explained and in the overall projection of the PCA versus the isomap uh, parts. Um, we then use again the first two or three components for visualization purposes the same way we did before. And again, you can see the ENSOs showing up in the uh, very clearly. Right now, you can even distinguish the 2016 event pretty nicely. They really, the strong ENSO are something else compared to the whole system. None of those models over those 40 years have anything comparable. Um, we can now consider the first PC or the first isomap. It really doesn't matter. The, the correlation between the two is um, always way above um, 0, 0.9 for the first. Um, and that essentially is giving us an ENSO, ENSO index for those models. And we can take the power spectrum of that. And the first thing that shows up is that, for example, in the present days, um, ECR does a decent job in reproducing the power spectrum of uh, the observed ENSO. Um, and in this case of the first isomap component or a, a PCA component, uh, MPI does not because as a power spectrum that picks really too much around eight years. Once we go into the future, MPI does something that looks more like noise, but there's at least a small peak around 3.6 years, which would be correct. Um, but ECR becomes extremely regular with a four year cycle all the time. 
And um, again, I'm showing the projection of the um, first um, isomap component on the four fields that we've been considering. And so you can just see how the, um, the fields are evolving. Um, I'm again showing the, um, um, the full field, the, the regression um, on the full um, of each other isomap time series. Um, now we use finally the metrics. And this is a pretty powerful visualization that shows you what those metrics look like. And what I'm doing is that instead of coloring them by the day or the so the, the day, so the time at which the system is described by the manifold, I'm uh, coloring by the ENSO value, uh, value at that time. Um, and what you can see is that El Nino, strong El Ninos, which are in dark red in era five, are characterized by a small dimension, so are relatively easy to describe, not necessary to um, anticipate with large advance, and also quite persistent. So when the system is in one of them, tend to stay there for a long time, and you can uh, predict this evolution once is in it really easily. Um, you can see that there is an asymmetry because the dark red are not superposed to any dark blue. And in fact, La Niñas are not as simple as El Niños. And the other thing that you can see when you look at the models is that the models are really not doing the same behavior at all. EC Earth tends to put El Niños more or less in the right spot, um, but it's really not getting to the same values of persistent EC and local dimension. Um, NPI as an asymmetry in favor of La Niñas, which is opposite to the observation. So lower dimension and higher predictability for La Niña events, once higher stability for La Niña events once they're in. Uh, so greater persistence for La Niñas. And um, MPI in the future goes to a, towards a situation that is closer to what we are observing today, while in easier to everything becomes less um, robust and overall greater um, local dimension uh, without any very strong event, because all those events become extremely regular, but are not necessary. Um, the, they don't have the characteristic of the observed one at all. We can now plot those quantities and essentially make uh, PDFs, so histogram of the values uh, of, the, of the local dimension for each day and of the inverse of persistence for each day. And those are the results. So what this is showing you is that while they differ from era five, uh, which is the blue one, the two models in today time, um, which is at the top, have very similar overall local dimension and overall inverse of persistency. The two, the green and orange PDFs are almost superposed one on top of the other. This is independent of the fact that the two ENSO look different from just looking at their um, the evolution of their um, SST in El Nino index, essentially. In the future, they do evolve differently. And those are the, the second line of plots of PDFs. And what you can see is that easier gets into a very persistent, those, those have easy, very regular ENSOs. Um, the local dimension is not significantly different, even if it decreases a little bit. And in terms of um, the, the, very, the very large differences in the persistency. So the question here that comes out is, what is the contribution of each variables to those global PDF? Because here we have four variables and the, the two PDFs look very similar. 
right? So, um, but then the behavior goes in the future and it's different. So it must be that the relationship between the four variables is different. And so what is each of those variable uh, contributing to the system? Um, this is just another plot showing what those local dimension and uh, inverse of persistency look like in the past, in the in historical time, and in the future for the two models, just a different way of visualizing the same plot that we just saw before. So where those PDFs are coming from. But this is the more interesting one. So here I'm taking the PDF of the multivariable, uh, which is the blue one in all those plots. And then I'm considering the three, the four variables separately and looking at the PDF of, again, um, local, um, um, dimension and inverse of persistency separately for each of them. And then I'm doing the same for the models. And I'm defining a difference among the PDFs because the idea is that the resolution is different. Uh, obviously those models are unable to get properly all the small scale dynamics, but ideally a climate model should be able to represent how those variable contribute to the global system, how each of them is contributing. And so the difference between the PDF, it's what I want my model to be able to capture more than anything else to a zero order level. And so what I'm plotting here is the distance among the PDF in the on the right of this figure colored by how distant they are for, um, and obviously you always get a one uh, for the distance between um, a zero, the, the distance between one variable at itself is going to be zero. What is the difference, the distance between the PDF of let's say temperature versus the PDF of OLR? And that's what is plotted in those colored plots on the, on the right. And what you want is that the model should be able to get those colors more or less in the right way. And what emerged immediately is that MPI is actually not doing that at all. And ECR is doing a better job among the two models. The, uh, the plot for uh, ECR to look resemble a little bit more the one that is observed in both local dimension and um, inverse of persistency. The one for MPI really does not. And so that posed the question of, but at the same time, when we go back and look at what they were doing, when all the variables were considered together, they were pretty much doing the same thing. So we can do then, and look more in details at what those difference, what the difference, are, where the difference are coming from, and which are really the variables where we should focus on um, in order to understand the different behavior of those models in projecting very different tensor in the future, for example. And of course, this is just an example. You can use this framework to do it anywhere you want. We just tested this to uh, um, against resolution and different ensemble members uh, to show that it's it's a very robust, um, uh, those are very robust quantities and very robust relationship. And so here it's just different members. I'm just showing one example. Um, things are really not changing whenever you use another one. You don't need very long runs. 40 years is plenty to characterize the distribution. You need daily data, but you essentially don't need ensembles and you don't need uh, very long runs um, to have a characterization of the system using um, manifold learning. So in conclusion for this part, and I will then just spend 10 minutes on the first extension of this whole idea. In uh, era five, there is definitely a faster saturation of the residual variance uh, using isomap compared to PCA. 
Uh, so essentially you need fewer dimensional components for describing the whole dynamics than if you use PCA. This is not the case for models where the two, essentially the system in the models is just too, too linear. And so the difference between PCAs and isomap is not strong enough. The models have different answer representations, but nonetheless, the manifold has very similar multivariate geometrical properties in the past, in the historical time. Um, that's not true when we go into the future. And the isomap residual variance for um, the each piece um, for the variability differs from the PCI, but that's not true for the models. So again, um, the two models are still struggling in capturing the nonlinear um, behavior. When we go into the future, things change and there is a very different response between the two models. And this seems to be really linked to different um, um, behavior in OLR and surface winds. And, uh, and especially it's the um, V component that in the, in the two models respond in very different ways. Um, none of the model and none of the assemble that we consider for the model span any an El Nino event comparable to the three strong ones that we observed. So that, that piece of the phase space continue to be completely empty for the models independently on the ensemble. Um, and this is another property that um, it's interesting because it's so robust among different ensemble members that really you don't seem to um, need to run very large ensemble to characterize those model biases. What do you want, we want to do next? And this would be in collaboration with a colleague of mine here at Georgia Tech, Saibal Mukopadahi, um, who is an expert in artificial intelligence. The idea for the models, for the climate models, will be to use our current graph network, which has a casual message and uh, learns the interrelationship between the variables. And then we try to correct for the model and constrain the RGN to with what we learn from the reanalysis and from the model, figure it out what the bias is and try to correct the model with that. Um, so use the RGN as a bias correction piece, essentially. Um, the advantage of that is that the model will continue to have their physics and so to have their conservation properties and to continue to go forward in time with those conservation properties, while at each output, we will be correcting what the interaction should look like, having learned how the interaction should behave based on the physics that we learn from the analysis. This is, of course, something that may work, how, how far into the future this may go. It may be a different question. However, we had already in the analysis, we do have climate change ongoing. And so one idea is also to try to figure it out exactly what has changed in those relationships and kind of pull out the signal, again, using the urgen of the climate change piece from the analysis. How this can work exactly, we still have to do it. So. I don't have much. Um, we do have some base, both from dynamical system theory and from artificial intelligence that tell us that there is some hope, but it's definitely a longer term project. On the short term, we try to see if we can just take one variable and do it um, and use something a little bit simpler uh, that are AGN. We just use a recurrent uh, neural network and so the idea is, again, to characterize the uh, attractor, the, the uh, space space, take a model that we know as a certain bias and try to correct for that bias and try to predict moving forward. What we did here is just to look at uh, the loop current in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, which is a very simple feature to identify in SSH images. So we are going to use um, SSH data from GCOS 
and we have ICOM and CODA analysis, which is a uh, analysis and prediction system uh, that we know is a little bit too unstable because it predicts that the loop current detach a little bit too often compared to what is in the observation. So we had a very simple bias that we knew we had to correct for. And then of course, the other thing that it does is that often the evolution of the mesoscale large eddies that, that are detached from the loop current evolves differently from the um, in the observation compared to the analysis. Uh, so we, we do this in three steps. First, we characterize the um, uh, attractor. Then we use a sequence to sequence recurrent neural network to correct and to figure it out the bias. And then we use, a, and we do this at the resolution of the GCOS data, which is a especially n time lower than what ICOM give us. And then we use a super resolution convolutional neural network to downscale the input, the uh, output of the um, recurrent neural network to the analysis grid and, and go back into ICOM. And this is work that um, I've done in collaboration with Guanping Liu, who is now at the University of Hawaii, and uh, Julian Brayard, who is uh, in Norway at NERSC. So this is the representation again with uh, daily data, uh, 20, uh, yeah, uh, 20 years of data, um, actually 10 years of data of the loop in this case. Uh, GCOS, ICOM at the resolution that we have, so at the spatial resolution that we have, and GCOS in reality, the temporal resolution of, of GCOS is less because it's really of the order of a week given the passages of the, the four satellites that go over the Gulf. Um, and then ICOM when is low process, so it's uh, at the same daily uh, and spatial resolution of GCOS. And still, what you can see just comparing the figure that is a label as A and C is that there is clearly a higher dimensionality that emerges in C compared to more regular, in a way simpler, um, GCOS uh, uh, manifold. We went into the system, and what we found is that really the problem in ICOM is the second. You have here the using isomap or using PCA does not change much. The system has more or less a low level of nonlinearity, so really it doesn't matter. Um, so we can use EOFs. And the second EOF in, in uh, GCOS is really the third EOF in my ICOM. And the second EOF in my ICOM is a mix of things in GCOS, which we don't fully understand why it's there. And we have done um, an analysis on that, but really um, it's a little bit unclear what the meaning is. It, our best explanation is that it's linked to the data assimilation um, workflow of the model. Anyway, what we do is that we have all the time series of um, the various component, we use nine in this case, uh, we stop at nine. Um, we don't see a huge advantage of going above that. Um, we put them in, we learn what is the, the bias is, and then we correct the ICOM ones with the bias and we predict uh, essentially the section of the data that is past the green line. Um, here, what I'm showing is the output of that step. Uh, what you see is the difference in RMS error between ICOM and GCOS, and then between GCOS and the truncation at the nine PCs. Um, so the error, of course, gets much less, and we are still doing a, a better job by correcting the first nine PCs than by considering only nine PC essentially. And then what you see um, on the right is the corrected um, seven days uh, forecast. In, in the case of, the, uh, of this is really a forecast where we are forecasting the bias and then correcting um, ICOM with that 
um, with what we forecast in terms of bias. And that is using the realistic GCOP base for the correction. This is essentially the outcome corrected. And as you can see, we, we definitely improve compared to the, um, the panel all the way to the left. And this is everything I had today. So this is promising. We seem to be able to do something, at least with one variable in a very simple system. So now the next step is to manage to do this on um, a real climate system and possibly uh, with 20 variables or so. So go into something um, much more um, high dimensional. And also for certain areas on the ocean, especially I'm also interested in the, in the North Atlantic current and Gulf Stream on top of the loop, try to see if it makes sense to go operational with this kind of bias correction, because it's relatively cheap. Once you have learned what the bias is, it's really a further step that takes few seconds um, and it could help in, um, in the forecast, in this case, at least up to two weeks. And this is everything I have. Um, I want to thank you. And um, I just want to uh, show uh, the faces of Guamping and Fabrizio who worked in my group and did um, most of the work that I presented. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bracco. So now is our Q&A session. So if anyone has any questions, please go ahead and raise your hand or just go ahead and unmute yourself and ask it. Or if you don't have a, um, a microphone, you can just type in the chat what your question is and I will read it out loud. Safa, you can go ahead. Oh, great. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Bracco, for this uh, excellent and intellectually stimulating talk. Very. Uh, important topic, very interesting results. So um, my question is about uh, the use of EC Earth and comparison of its results to MPI and the reanalysis data, particularly mm -hmm. uh, the very first the slide where you showed the results of the manifolds. So there was a clear, um, I think then, yes, yes, exactly. So for the seasonal cycle, so there there is a clear difference between EC Earth and what you can see in uh, the reanalysis and MPI models. So I was wondering if this can be explained maybe by uh, the fact that EC Earth is an outlier compared to other uh, CMIP five or CMIP models, particularly because EC Earth is known to have a large unforced variability outside of the typical range of uh, other CIMIP models. And uh, so I was wondering if you have any, any insights about that. No, um, so this one, it's really just a seasonal cycle. So it's this kind of toroid structures that develop. And when you look at a tree in three dimensions, uh, the difference are less significant, significant. You have a little bit of a bigger hole in the middle, but if you look at the time series, um, you know the difference between EC Earth and and MPI are really not too strong, I would say. Um, also in the projection. The difference seems to come mostly from the second component, isomap component, but both model in the second component diverge quite substantially from the observations, more substantially than the first one, which is already locally still biased significantly in both. Um, so I don't have a, um, an obvious answer. EC Earth had, had as this very regular El Nino and the Enzo cycle is absolutely regular, they managed to trick it to do it less regularly in the uh, historical, and then it comes back. So while it has uh, a lot of internal variability at, the, at higher latitudes compared to other models, when you actually look at this earth in the tropics, that variability is really not there. It's actually really overly regular if you want. However, in the tropics, what is really interesting is that it's doing a much better job at representing the 
observe a relationship among the variables. NPI is really off. Um, so it personally, if I had to pick one of those models, I would definitely pick EC Earth on top of the other, because the other is really a problem in how it puts the variables together. But there is some tuning that goes on in all those models. And so they are they are essentially doing the overall system in a very, very similar way. And this is quite amazing. They are two different models at two different resolutions. Um, we can use the original resolution if it's here and it, nothing changes. We have tried that. Uh, we have tried to further down, um, downscale, I mean, upscale both. So even lower resolution for both, you still see the same uh, dimension for quite some range of resolution. Then of course it becomes everything too coarse. Uh, so this is a very robust feature of both models but they're doing it by compensating between different variables in very different ways. And this is actually a way to just visualize that, um, which I think it was a little bit missing from a lot of the things we're doing with, with climate model. This is a tool that really allows you to do that. And then, you know, the idea would be to try to modify the model and correct for some of the bias that you see in the relationship among the variables learn what those relationships should be and then tell the model that should try to do them in that way to just the artificial intelligence algorithm. Um, you can also take a different approach and decide that you want to go into the model and really figure it out what are the processes that are significantly different. Um, which is a very valid approach as well. Excellent, thank you very much. Thank you. Also, Claudia had a couple questions. Claudia Tabaldi. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Um, hi, uh, thank you, Annalisa, for this really interesting talk. Um, I, I'm not an expert in, in anything of what you presented, so this may be a very uh, silly question, but uh, what I know is that the approach of linear inverse modeling has been applied extensively to the study of ENSO, and one of the things that really struck me in your presentation is this idea that models are too linear <laughs> compared to reality. And so I was wondering if if this, first of all, if this was known already, um, and if this kind of, um, I don't, I wouldn't say undermines, but, you know, puts a little bit of, of, um, of a caveat in uh, using linear inverse modeling for uh, modeling uh, ENSO. Um, and then I have more of a question about experimental design that if nobody else has questions, I can do later. It's not very interesting. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Um... If you ask me, the answer is yes, I would not use in, uh, inverse linear modeling for ENSO. At the same time, it is true that when you are in an ENSO, and especially in an El Nino cycle, but it's true also in part for La Nina, uh, you are pretty linear in both because you have a really small number of degrees of freedom and you have a high predictability. However, this is true when you are in one of them. In reality, what, what if you look at the number of points that you have here, here you have a whole cloud, which is the large majority. By This is 70% of the points are in this cloud. And this cloud is a lot of degrees of freedom and very low predictability. And none of the model have that cloud. They are simply not filling that region at all. So what that cloud does it's not something that you can gather with an inverse linear model. It's just no way to do it. How that is important specifically if you just want to catch ENSO at seasonal, star, seasonal scale, maybe not that much. And so you may have an application if you just want to do that. But if you want to capture how the whole system is going to evolve uh, 50 years from now, I'm afraid that you need this cloud. Thank you. That's very interesting. Do we have any other questions before we close up for the day? 
I, I can ask my my um, design question if, if nobody else wants. I, I was wondering, given that you chose these two models with different um, resolutions, would it would it be interesting to instead to take the same model but at two different resolutions and see what the role of resolution really is here? Because here it's a little bit difficult to to either you know uh, blame it or or be happy about resolution, given that you're you have two dimensions moving at the same time um yes sure i do suspect that if you're not changing strongly parameterization in the model nothing really is going to happen makes sense but but yes and the other thing that is interesting in ec hurt that we have for example looked is uh, whenever they use stochastic parameterization whenever they don't and we never finished that work because uh, fabrizio left and we were also looking with anish subramanian at that and it's actually interesting because um, it doesn't change the local dimension at all in the model zero has no impact on that the only thing that it does is to add a little bit of noise so that the inverse of persistent changes and it's of course less persistent but nothing is changing in the dimension part it's nearly identical which means that is really just a stochastic piece that is not adding much to the bias like you're not correcting anything by adding that you're just making your two stable processes to be a little bit less stable but it's really not coming out to in the whole system um when they're using it and and that is an interesting piece because that is what they do to make ENSO non-regular. And so the characteristic of that ENSO are not changing. The bias of that ENSO, the structural topological bias of their ENSO is not changing. It's not that because it's regular, it's more biased in a way, it still continue to have the same problems. Mm -hmm. Thank you again. Sure. Last call for questions. Okay, well, unless I am interrupted here, um, I think that is the end of our talk today. Thank you everyone for attending. Thank you so much to Dr. Bracco for um, coming and giving us this great talk today. We will resume next week with our seminar series, um, which will also be a remote talk. Yes, just also be a remote talk. Um, and then we're in person the week after that. Okay, thank you everybody. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.